Hello and welcome back to English 332, Writing in the Professions. This will, uh, today's uh, lecture will be covering chapter seven, communicating across cultures. Obviously a very, very important topic and really interesting topic, I think too. I love the uh, thinking about people from other countries and how the, the stuff we kind of assume that's common everywhere turns out to be uh, really different. Even like body language and uh, how much space you have uh, between you and your friend when you're uh, talking to them. There's just all kinds of really interesting stuff in this uh, chapter here. Uh, but it's also very, very useful information because just about every business, every profession, every office, you know, no matter what it is, uh, we're constantly dealing uh, with people from uh, other countries who speak different languages, who have very different ways of life, uh, basically. <laughs> As my grandpa likes to say, the you know, no matter where you go in the world, there's good people there. You know, so I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, the idea, though, is just that there's the differences, right? And if you're not aware, you don't have respect for these differences, you can get yourself or your country uh, or your company, rather, uh, into trouble. And there's lots of uh, examples of that in the chapter. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get into this. All right, so let's take a look here at our learning objectives for this lecture. There are seven, and we'll be talking about why global business and why uh, diversity is becoming important, or is uh, becoming more important, rather. Uh, we'll be talking about the values, how our values and belief affect our responses to other people. Uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, the nonverbal communication, uh, body language, gesturing, and even the space you have between uh, people, that how that differs in other places. Uh, we'll be talking about oral communication and written communication, how to adapt those uh, for a cross-cultural or a global audience, and then why it is so important to check cultural uh, generalizations or stereotypes. So let's get into these then. Okay, so the first slide here is about culture, and you could think about your own culture if you grew up in America or another country, if you grew up in Minnesota or another state. Uh, the language that you speak, uh, all of that stuff, is, we label that as culture. And it really does shape your values, uh, what's important to you, your priorities, and lots of and lots of practices, ways that you go about speaking and writing, uh, as well as just day-to-day -day activities, you know, the, uh, the way the food you eat, etc. Et uh, a lot of that is shaped by culture. Once you start thinking about your own culture and how it shaped you, uh, that'll make it easier to start thinking about uh, well, what about people from other cultures? Uh, what do I need to be aware of? What is what is universal and what is uh, unique uh, to a particular culture? And it's important because uh, modern business modern businesses require uh, dealing with other cultures. Uh, so even if you have a little shop here in, in St. Cloud, let's say, uh, you can't just uh, assume that the only people coming into your shop will be uh, speaking, you know, fluent fluent in English, and they're all from. Uh, the surrounding area, you know, of course not. You're going to have people there uh, probably on a daily uh, basis from other countries that uh, grew up speaking different languages. And uh, that, that's just the reality uh, that we're living in. And if you want to have a successful business, uh, then you have to be uh, good at dealing with that. Okay, so moving on then. The successful, <laughs> a successful intercultural communicator. Uh, what does that look like? Uh, well, it means you're aware of values, beliefs, and practices in other cultures. And, uh, again, thinking about your own culture, your own values, beliefs, and practices is a good place to start. Uh, being sensitive to differences among individuals uh, within a culture. So this is a, a really key one here. Uh, this will help you avoid stereotypes. Uh, you might have, a lot of people, when they tell me you're from Minnesota, uh, they think that you... Uh, you like to <laughs> go ice fishing, you love hockey, uh, you uh, eat a lot of lutefisk or whatever it is. And yeah, there's, there's probably people that do all, in this class that do all those things, but nevertheless, uh, you can't just assume that uh, the individuals within any culture are going, it's not like they're all just uh, carbon copies of each other. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it leads to stereotyping, uh, stereotyping basically when you say something like that or just assume that they're all the same. Uh, aware that one's uh, preferred values are influenced by culture are not always right. Uh, so, for example, uh, they, they talk about in the book different 
attitudes towards uh, punctuality, right? Or, uh, being on time is really important for some cultures and other cultures they really have a more relaxed <laughs> view of that sort of thing and uh, some cultures you can find here in the u.s uh, for example reject technology you know think about um, uh, amish families and how they have a different a, a different relationship let's say to, to technology than, than you or i do and you don't want to just jump in there and say well that's you know they're wrong. Uh, they should have. Uh, they should embrace technology like everybody else. Well, who are, who are we to say that? You know that, that's that's their business, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, the kids growing up in that in that um, environment are influenced by their culture just like you are uh, by yours. Uh, so if you want to be successful, you have to be aware. And here's some other general points about all this. So. I want to just being willing to ask questions about preferences and behaviors. Uh, this this comes up sometimes um, in my life when we're planning something, maybe a banquet or a lunch or something, and the, the question comes up of, well, what if we have people there uh, from India? Uh, should we? Is it okay to serve beef, <laughs> or uh, should we have pork on the menu for people from, uh, you know, Islamic countries and so on and so forth? Uh, so the idea is, is just it's so easy just to ask you know you could <laughs> what do you give people some options right uh, do you want if they have an option there for beef another option for uh, fish let's say uh, then letting them just asking them and getting it right even at the risk even if it makes you look like you might be ignorant like I, I don't know everything about every, every culture in the world I mean I don't know why I should be embarrassed to, uh, about that uh, what would be more embarrassing is just to make all kinds of assumptions and then get it wrong and then have to be told, you know, that <laughs> you've offended somebody. Uh, much better uh, just to ask questions and, and figure out what uh, what they want. Uh, being flexible and open to change. Uh, so for this, this could even be, I know we'll probably get into this later, but like the handshaking, you know, a lot of people these days are... Uh, saying uh, i would rather fist bump instead of shake hands it's i guess there's less germs or something like that uh, but there's also uh, folks that it's basically taboo uh, for the women to shake the man's hand uh, in certain cultures let's uh, let's say so the idea is i can't i shouldn't just say well i don't care you know you, you you're going to have to shake my hand <laughs> uh, you can't be like that uh, you have to be flexible uh, even if you don't you don't have to agree with it or like it right it's just about uh, showing uh, respect uh, being sensitive to verbal and uh, nonverbal behavior uh, we'll get into some of that uh, but the book talked about all sorts of things like uh, whether people should be okay with a lot of silences or being interrupted uh, and then how close you sit together all of that stuff is actually a uh, cultural based And here's some points on the importance of global businesses. And I think the book, it kind of paints this picture of this all being just wonderful and, <laughs> you know, inevitable. Uh, of course, there has been a lot of pushback on it, uh, especially lately with all this uh, talk about um, putting your own country first. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not going to get into all that here. Uh, but anyway, here's the reality uh, or the, some of the facts, I guess, uh, about the nature of global business. Uh, one is uh, exports. Uh, so especially now that we're kind of in so much stuff is on the web, uh, it's not really a big deal. It's almost the norm now that uh, just because you're making products here in Minnesota doesn't mean that it's, you're just making them for Minnesotans. Uh, you might be exporting that, uh, let's say it's uh, jam or uh, honey or something. Uh, you, you never know who's going to want to buy that. And, you know, as a business person, you, you like that idea, right? You want to expand your market. Uh, just in my uh, my experience, uh, believe it or not, I, I post a lot of these videos. Uh, these videos are on YouTube. And I got some there about grammar, English, and all this stuff. And it always amazes me how I can get into YouTube and look at the statistics of who who's watching them and, and where are they from and uh, there's quite a few people watch these videos uh, from places like uh, Norway or Sweden or Germany. 
uh, some people from uh, a lot of Russians, <laughs> a pretty sizable Russian and Finland. A lot of Eastern European uh, folks watch these. Uh, so that, that's just really interesting to think about. And a lot of the times, uh, you know, I don't know if there's more more people from those countries watching them or not, but they uh, that's certainly an important or an essential part of my audience, I, I guess you could say. Uh, many companies depend on the vendors located in other countries. Uh, so even if you're not, you know, even if you're doing your manufacturing here, let's say, or you're running a restaurant here, uh, whatever it is, uh, you're probably buying products from other countries, like China, India, where, wherever. Uh, companies adapting products and services uh, for the local cultures. So this is always interesting to me. Uh, growing up in the deep south uh, from Louisiana, a lot of the same restaurants uh, they have there uh, are here as well, but they have slightly different menus, right? It's just only recently, and the example is the sweet tea. <laughs> Uh, so down south, I mean, just about any restaurant you go to is going to have sweet tea, and they'll have uh, Tabasco sauce around for people that want to put Tabasco sauce on their food. Uh, when I first moved to Minnesota about, I guess, about 12 years ago, it, I couldn't get sweet tea anywhere. <laughs> it's really just, it was bothering me. I just could not find a place uh, that had, they, they'd have a, either no tea or it would be unsweetened. I just couldn't, or they had a, maybe hot tea, uh, but I couldn't find it. Uh, but then McDonald's, uh, the McDonald's here, I guess everywhere, just started offering sweet tea, I guess about, I don't know how many years ago that was. And so, so there for a while, I was uh, eating at McDonald's all the time, uh, just because it was the only place in town that had uh, the, the beverage I prefer. So, uh, <laughs> kind of a silly example, I guess, but I'm sure you could probably think of some some similar things that you miss uh, from your hometown. Uh, managers often need international experience uh, for the top level jobs. I mean, this is certainly true uh, as you move up in the office hierarchy. You might be selected to go on one of these trips to China uh, as part of a group, or maybe you're on the phone with them. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea, though, and, uh, to have a passport. We just I just finished grading the resumes, and uh, I didn't notice anybody that did this, but if you do own a passport, you know, sometimes people will mention that in their letter or in the resume, because it's kind of involved, and in, uh, having one kind of shows that you're prepared uh, to, for international travel, uh, which can be a plus, you know, if, the, if that job is, uh, you know, utilizes that. Uh, this slide is about workplace diversity. Uh, so the type of differences you might find among the people there at your job. And you can see there's, there's quite a few. Uh, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, regional and national origins, uh, social class, religion, <laughs> age, uh, sexual orientations, and uh, physical abilities. So some workplaces, I guess, would be more, di more diverse than others, but Again, I think it would be rare. I don't know any workplace you would I, that I can imagine, unless it's just one person working there, right? Uh, that there wouldn't be so, at least one of these uh, categories of uh, diversity in play. And let's see. This slide is talking about um, high contact, high context cultures, and, and this is all coming from an anthropologist, anthropologist named Edward Hall. And I'm not really sure the book mentioned that this is kind of uh, outmoded in anthropology, so <laughs> I don't really know why they're, uh, they're bringing it up here. Um, but I guess it's just kind of interesting to think about that. Uh, anyway, what, what is the high context culture? They say the, these, this is a culture that uh, most information comes from social relationships. So it's really important that you, you know the person really well, uh, you know all about their family, uh, let's say a lot about their background, and uh, you're not, ne not necessarily to the point or direct uh, in your communications. You, you kind of look at this, you know, the, you can imagine a business meeting where you're just kind of like, are we ever going to get to the business <laughs> at hand? You know, we're still talking here about our kids or something. Uh, when, when are you going to get to the, to the point of the meeting? Uh, so in this high context culture, uh, that would be considered rude, right? To keep trying to 
it's a, a jump to the business at hand. Uh, they want to be indirect, kind of, a, you know, again, take a while to get to it. Maybe be a little overly polite, feels like. Uh, being a little ambiguous, uh, so not wanting just to commit to something, uh, yes or no. <laughs> it's probably a lot more uh, infer, infer, inferment going on, I suppose, than a clear, direct answers to concrete questions. And this is interesting, I thought. Uh, so they're saying that these high context cultures, and these would include, they say, uh, Asia, the Middle East, uh, Latin America. And they say in those cultures, people put a lot more value in an oral agreement. <clears throat> so if I promise you I will do this, <laughs> that carries a lot more weight uh, than a contract would. You know, maybe they just, if we write it down in a contract, it's almost like you could just ignore that. And what's really important is what we said uh, we would do. So again, I don't know how accurate all this is anymore, how it's, uh, oh, there's one more, sorry. I rely heavily on nonverbal signs. And so they talked about things like the bowing, uh, for example. You know, something like that could carry a lot more weight uh, than what they say in, in greeting, right? So this is all really interesting, but again, I'm not sure the <laughs> uh, how uh, useful it is uh, to think about these these sort of generalizations about <clears throat> cultures anymore, you know, Latin American, Japanese, Arabic, uh, and then the low context culture. Uh, they say we uh, this would include us in the United States and, and Western Europe. Uh, they say we uh, rely little on the context and just spell out the information. <laughs> uh, we value directness, uh, may see indirectness as dishonest or manipulative, right? So uh, usually when we go into a company, let's say, and we see, you know, the person there is saying, well, you know, how can I help you? <laughs> and you don't start off, when they ask you that, you don't say, well, let me start by telling you who I am and showing you some pictures of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they would think you were a little bit crazy almost, right? The, uh, like, what, what's this person's deal? Uh, just get, you know, why are you here? Um, you know, put it, put it bluntly. <laughs> so what I, and why I kept stressing in those uh, cover letters for the resumes, you know, just say I'm writing this, I'm writing to apply for the job uh, posted, blah, blah, blah. And that's being very direct. Uh, people don't want to read a letter that takes forever to get to the point. Uh, speaking of writing letters, uh, valuing the written word more than oral statements. So here we would say, if it's really important, get it in writing. Uh, get it in writing because uh, just because somebody says something, uh, it doesn't really matter, right? If, if it's worded differently in the contract, whatever it is you sign, uh, that's what you're really getting. That's what you that's what they're you can hold them liable for. Uh, just what they said. Well, you know, you might be able to get some kind of legal recourse out of it, but that uh, uh, that written contract is going to matter a lot more. Yeah, North American, uh, they put German here. <laughs> they almost make German sound kind of mean in this <laughs> chapter. Uh, Scandinavians, uh, I guess uh, you could probably think of some more maybe, uh, but those are the examples. And this slide, we're moving from the hall now to somebody named Geert. Hofstede, and he's got these five dimensions that he says you can apply uh, to different countries, and they've apparently done this with uh, 74 different countries and regions, and just as a way to kind of generalize about what a culture's like. Uh, they talked about power and inequality. Uh, so the, the United States, for example, uh, says that they have uh, tend to have more men in positions of power, uh, but there's more equality at all the different levels. Uh, individualism and collectivism, uh, so do people tend to think of themselves more as part of a group, part of a family, or do they are they just thinking about themselves as individuals? And I think it's safe to say uh, in the U.S. We, we tend to fall in that, you know, it's more important who you are uh, than your family name or you know, where, <laughs> uh, whatever group uh, you're part of. And of course, this is uh, one thing that gets, if you go to boot camp, for example, a lot of that is moving you away from individualism and starting to think of yourself as part of that, um, you know, part of the being a Marine, not being a John. 
Uh, masculinity and uh, femininity, of course, these uh, have a these vary uh, tremendously uh, across cultures. We we talked there, and really, I think this is changing a lot. Uh, this idea that uh, you know, in in America, <clears throat> all the bosses are men, all the uh, you know the secretaries basically are women. I think that's really seen nowadays as being old-fashioned and really just sexist. And, uh, a lot of this is being, um, you know, a lot more, <laughs> a lot more blur. <laughs> the boundaries between those are getting a lot blurrier uh, these days. Uh, uncertainty, avoidance. Uh, this is, you know, how comfortable are you not knowing something or <laughs> uh, being okay with uh, not being sure about something? It's kind of weird to think about that one. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would be real comfortable uh, being uncertain, but uh, apparently that's one of the categories. And then the long-term vor- uh, versus short-term orientations. You know, how do you th- do? You tend to think more long-term or more short-term. Apparently that's something else that uh, varies tremendously among cultures. And then we have uh, values, beliefs, and practices. And this is, a, I think, the point to really stress is that, you know, a lot of this is unconscious stuff. You don't necessarily sit, it's not, unless somebody sat down one day and explained to you <laughs> uh, all of your values, beliefs, and practices. And you said, oh, okay, you know, I'll sign on to that. You know, a lot of this stuff is just stuff you picked up observing, you know, as a kid. You, you probably don't even really know how you came to have these views. Uh, you just kind of assume that everybody shares them, uh, but of course they they vary tremendously. Uh, so let's look at some of these uh, uh, views. It could be fairness. What are your views on on fairness, for example? Do you, <laughs> uh, if you're a uh, classic example, you're waiting in a line, uh, you're queued up somewhere, and somebody breaks in breaks the line. Or, we talked about this in one of the previous uh, Ed puzzles, right? And I think most people here think that's really wrong. We really don't like that. Uh, we don't care who that person is. You know, if this person breaking a line is saying, look, I'm I'm really important. <laughs> uh, you should let me go first. Uh, we would just say, look, I don't care who you are, right? You're, we're all people here. Uh, you're no better than me or anybody else in this line. You know, go back to the, to the end. Uh, so that's just kind of our cultural view. Whereas they talked about some of these other places where, yeah, if there's a member of a basically a higher class person is comes up there, uh, then everybody lets them go first, right? Uh, again, that's something you'd probably see here. Um, affect responses to people and situations. Well, we, we certainly just covered that one. Uh, different cultures have different views of fairness, uh, groups, uh, competition. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. I think we could, you could probably think about groups in your own life where uh, some groups really value the com- comp- competitive angles of everything. Of course, sports uh, comes to mind, or games, game communities, or uh, gaming cultures, I, I should say. Uh, but there's plenty of other ones where that just—it's not really a competition. Uh, it's just more of a. Oh, what's a good example of that? I, don't know. <clears throat> I got a good friend who's really into the. Uh, Harley Davidsons is <laughs> always going on those uh, bike rides with his friends. Uh, so that's not, it's not like they get on their Harleys and race. You know, it's not really like that. It's just more about being a part of that group. Uh, different views on success. This one's really interesting. You know, what does it mean to be a success? Uh, we tend to think, or at least, uh, you know, I tend to think if you're really successful, you probably have a you're probably a pretty wealthy. Uh, you're really well liked, <laughs> have a high paying, uh, you got a lot of status, and a good house and all this stuff. Uh, but people from other cultures might just see that as just frivolous, uh, kind of uh, real shallow stuff. You know, maybe being successful for them would be uh, having achieved a certain, uh, I don't know, a state of enlightenment in their religion, <laughs> let's say, or, or maybe success is having a whole lot of kids. Uh, and that's somebody like me uh, that doesn't have the uh, the kids uh, would not be considered a success. Uh, social status, uh, again, one that trem- <laughs> varies tremendously. And, you know, I love this uh, show. Uh, if you ever watched Downton Abbey, it's a show about uh, 
I guess, written back in the, I'm not sure, I guess it's around 1940s or 50s. But you really see this in that show how the people that, if you just happen to be born into a certain family, a certain class of person, uh, you're really treated differently by everybody. And if you happen to be a serv uh, part of the servant class or the lower class, working class, uh, people really look down on you. I mean, it, it really strikes you when you watch that show. <laughs> the whole time you're watching it, at least for me, I'm thinking, wow, that is just so unfair. Uh, that's terrible. You know, these people will never be uh, successful like the people in this uh, privileged family are. Uh, but, of course, that's just my own uh, cultural views coming into play. Like the people on that show don't think it's unfair or that this is wrong. And they're just looking at it as uh, this is just the way that it is, you know. Uh, so now we get into one of my favorite topics, uh, nonverbal communication. Now, I don't think this co topic gets enough coverage in, in college courses. It's, you know, it's estimated that, oh, I forget, 60%, let's say, <laughs> of communication is not really anything to do with words. It's uh, more about uh, your body language, your gestures, uh, space, all, all, this, all that stuff. And you think it's universal, right? You think, well, everybody... Uh, around the world knows what laughter is or what a smile means, uh, but really there could be all kinds of cultural factors at work there. And it might not be that this, you know, this uh, young lady here is kind of got making like a thumbs up uh, gesture, uh, which probably when you see that you think, well, she's saying you're okay or <laughs> everything's cool. <laughs> uh, but who knows, right? I don't know. A signal such as smiles and gestures, uh, yeah, they could be misinterpreted as easily as words. So I don't know if you've ever seen somebody make a gesture that you didn't know, like, what, what is that? You know, I like to listen to a lot of heavy metal and go to uh, metal concerts, and everybody's always making this uh, gesture. I call it something like the horns. Uh, there's different names for it, but it's kind of a thing you do with your hand, right? And a lot of people that uh, you know, might just be watching that and not know what <laughs> what is that gesture? <laughs> what are they doing? Uh, they might. It's even been uh, said that oh, they're making the sign of the devil. So, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I just totally misinterpreting it. Maybe on purpose. I don't know. Uh, but it's certainly something that you can't just assume everybody would know what what that is. I thought it was really interesting too in the book how they how they were talking about the flipping of the bird. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, what was it, one culture they were talking about in there, where if, if you see somebody might just be flip, waving the bird around, and it doesn't mean, they're not trying to be offensive, they're just saying they need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I have to admit, I, I laughed out loud at that one. It's, it's, a, it's a funny image. Uh, but again, people in different cultures have different ways of uh, basically flipping the bird. It's not the middle finger, it's... Uh, I forget what they uh, what they were talking, how they said it was done in in Britain. I've actually seen it a couple times on shows and uh, from the BBC, and I didn't know what it was. I was like, what what kind of gesture <laughs> is that? Uh, but uh, now I know that's that's basically how they flip you off. Uh, important to be conscious of signals sent and received. <laughs> Yep. Okay, let's look at some of the different types of nonverbal uh, communication here. Uh, we've got body language, and that can uh, come in many different forms. Uh, eye contact. So should you look at them in, directly in the eye? A lot of times in the U.S., you're told you should make eye contact. If, if I'm teaching, I'm walking around usually looking at different students, and they make eye contact with me. And, uh, that's just perfectly normal. It's kind of what you expect. It's kind of weird. And sometimes I've had classes where I'm doing that and just kind of you know, doing what I do, and this is nobody's looking at me. <laughs> they're all kind of looking down. <laughs> it's not like they're not paying attention. They're just not making eye contact. And, and for me, it, it just kind of strikes me as uh, like either they're really shy or they <laughs> just want to go home <laughs> or they don't care. Uh, about what I'm saying. They're kind of distracted, maybe. 
And maybe that's true, uh, but then again, depending on where that student is from, maybe it would, maybe they're just, in their mind, they're just being polite. I mean, maybe they think I would never be so rude as to make eye contact with my professor. Uh, facial expressions. Uh, this is one that, <laughs> you know, I always say there's a reason why actors get paid big money, right? Because it's, it's really hard to fake uh, a smile or a frown uh, or not, or to, or to hide that, you know, if you're really mad and you're trying to keep a straight face. Uh, I guess you could say this is important for poker too, right? These uh, facial expressions, but it takes a lot of training to, to you know, to, to do that on command. Uh, most most people, though, this is just completely unconscious, and uh, they can be they could be communicating something like being angry and not even realize it. You know how how strong of a facial expression they're making. Uh, people, some of my students sometimes talk about me, and they'll say he's something like he's making that face. <laughs> you know, that's he's that's that sort of look. He's giving you that look. You know, I'm like what in the world are you talking about? Uh, what look? You know, I don't I don't. I guess there's nobody around to snap a photo when, when I'm doing it and I don't do it on <laughs> videos. <laughs> so I don't even know myself what, is this, what this looks like. It's just completely unconscious, uh, but apparently the, it can be intimidating, I guess. Uh, and then gestures. Uh, we talked about some of those already. Uh, but, um, let's see if they give me any more examples here that uh, we haven't talked about. Uh, head shakes. Oh, that was an interesting one. Yeah, like you uh, shake your head, nod, or... Uh, was it nodding and shaking your head? Yes and no, but it could be flipped over. It could be the opposite in these other cultures. So you can see somebody, they're nodding, but they're saying, um, no. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, thumbs up signs. The V sign uh, carries uh, different meanings. You know, one of my favorite examples of these gestures is if you ever watch uh, one of the Star Trek shows, you see the uh, the Vulcans uh, they're always kind of doing this. <laughs> That's horrible drawing. <laughs> uh, but they make this uh, hand gesture with their, kind of like a V with the two fingers, or they got the their fingers uh, spread. And they say that means live long and prosper. And what happened, where that uh, gesture came from, was the actor playing Spock, uh, Leonard, Leonard Nimoy, uh, grew up, uh, he was uh, from a Jewish family, and there was, a, I guess, a part of their... Uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, or service, <laughs> uh, where you're not supposed to look at the, the rabbi, right? Everybody's supposed to keep their eyes closed and not look at what he's doing over there, he or she's doing. But anyway, uh, Leonard uh, peeked and saw that they were making that uh, hand gesture. He thought, that's really cool. I like that. Uh, so when they were developing the Vulcans on Star Trek, he said, how about this? You know, I, I could do this, make this little gesture here. <laughs> and I guess it must be fun for uh, uh, Jewish folks to watch uh, to watch Spock and see that symbol. And they think, well, that's, that's that thing we weren't supposed to see. <laughs> anyway, I just always thought that was uh, fun. Uh, touch, you know, uh, this is, you know, I remember when I first started teaching, there was this, there were some discussions about, uh, you know, should you go over there? If, if you're talking to a student, do you touch them on the shoulder, uh, pat, on the, pat them on the back, you know, this kind of stuff. It, the same thing <laughs> like that's really gone away. <laughs> I don't hear anybody advocating that anymore. Uh, I have heard arguments that, yeah, if you touch, if you say you pat somebody on the shoulder, uh, that sort of confers, uh, makes them feel better and more confident maybe. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. You, you see sometimes uh, some professors hugging other students. You know, I, I, <laughs> I just don't do any of that. It kind of makes me, uh, it kind of feels uncomfortable to me. I wouldn't want to make somebody else uncomfortable either. So I just, I say I don't. I don't do it, you know. But, you know, maybe somebody from a different culture, they think, wow, this is this Barton guy, he's really cold. You know, he, he's never... <laughs> He never uh, puts his uh, arm on my shoulder. <laughs> uh, so that's, again, something you'd have to go to different cultures. And I, I have some relatives that are from, uh, my in-laws in are from Greece, and I got some Italians uh, in the family, and they're very touchy. I mean, <laughs> you know, you'd be talking to them, and they'll get so close to you where you know, your legs are touching, your knees are touching, and you know, they're always 
touching you and you're like, wow, this is a lot of touching. <laughs> I'm not real comfortable with it, but, <laughs> you know, that's in, in their culture. Again, it would be they're probably more worried the, if they don't touch you or they sit too far away. That might uh, for them mean that they don't like you or they're not uh, they're, they're not friendly towards you, I guess. Um, so again, something really fun to think about in terms of cultures, and, and I don't know what to do really. <laughs> you know, if you do go to one of these, if I were to go to Greece or Italy, and this there is just so much touching, I'm just really uncomfortable with it. You know, to what extent should I just say, look, <laughs> uh, don't do that? Uh, how about you stay on your your side of the couch? <laughs> you know, I guess at some point you have to just you might just have to be potentially rude but then again maybe they should be uh, uh respecting your your culture too right and so you need your personal space uh, which brings us uh, to that one uh the personal space and uh yeah like how far do you uh, uh you sit together on the couch you know it's fun to go to the library here in the miller center uh, when there's lots of uh, international students there because you, you will see like uh people from different cultures and they'll be sitting right next to each other, just touching. Uh, but then you see other groups of students, and maybe those other students are just as good of friends. I mean, they really like each other. They're very close. Maybe they grew up together. Uh, but nevertheless, they'll be, you know, sitting across uh, the table, or they're both on. Uh, they got several feet in between them on the little bench, or whatever it is. Uh, you notice this on buses too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and something else, this might be a little bit crude to bring up, but uh, I've noticed when I go to the restroom and there'd be, uh, say, f uh, three or four urinals, uh, most of the time, uh, person number one comes in, they use the urinal on the, on the far right. If somebody else comes in, they'll use the one on the, they'll use the one far, they'll try to get as far away <laughs> from me as possible or from, uh, from the other, somebody else using that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes somebody will come in and they'll just go straight to that one right next to you, even though there's several available um, that are further away. You know, and the same thing with, I guess, I'm sure that you've noticed something like that yourself, uh, even if you're <laughs> a woman not uh, seeing the urinals. So I'm sure it's the same kind of deal. Um, and so even something like that, not something you probably think a lot about, but the I think the key to it is not just to assume uh, well, you know, what's wrong with this person? Why are they uh, using the one right next to me? They must be weird somehow. Well, maybe, but you know, maybe it's just uh, again their their culture coming into play. Uh, for them, it might seem like they're just being really rude to you. Uh, you know, if they did go to that one on the far left, um, <laughs> I don't know what that's a picture of. <laughs> uh, let's just assume that's a here. That's an L. <laughs> the other one on the far left, and um, that might be perceived, maybe they think that would be offensive to me, like they're saying, whoa, I, this guy's really smelly or something. I'm going to get a long ways away from him. <laughs> uh, see, I told you that we'd have a lot of fun with this uh, uh, this chapter. Uh, and then the time, uh, being on time, measuring time, and I've you've probably noticed this too, and I've definitely noticed this. Uh, I always tend to, and I'm always having to kind of chide myself about this, or kind of warn myself that, yeah, I like to start my class exactly on time. You know, I'll say it's class starts at three o'clock. It's you know, I'll, I'll even hold off. You know, if it's 258, <laughs> I'll just stand there. You know, I'll just check my email or something until it's exactly three o'clock. And then I then I start the class. And it's important to me. And it really it's irritating uh, when you got, you know, five, six minutes into the class. You still have people uh, coming in. To the class late and i just look at those students and i think wow this person's just really disrespectful uh, they're just interrupting everything they they just kind of being a, a jerk uh, especially if they do it all the time right or if it's yeah just if it's like a one-time deal uh, you know stuff happens right but I mean, we're talking like five or six times in a row they're substantially late uh, that just really bugs me but uh, what this chapter is telling us is that well, maybe it, maybe it is just the student doesn't have their act together. <laughs> they, maybe they don't care. Uh, maybe they even want uh, to piss me off. Uh, this is all certainly possible. Uh, but the, the point is, maybe it's a cultural thing. And where they're from, it's not a big deal. 
you know, they, they don't stress this uh, punctuality uh, so much. And, you know, if you say you'll be there at three o'clock and really the idea is you'll probably be there sometime between uh, three o'clock and four o'clock, let's say. And, and that varies uh, tremendously by my culture. And, and there's something else they kind of threw out there was uh, they said Germans are really particular about this. But uh, again, my in-law from uh, Greece, he's also very, very you know, picky about time. I mean, to the point of, a, you know, if you say you're going to be somewhere, you know, if you say you're going to call him at you know what time well i'll call you at eight o'clock <clears throat> and so that means <laughs> that means eight o'clock and if you're like eight ten eight twenty he'll, he'll actually start worrying like what's you know what happened are, are you okay or <laughs> get get mad if it's just some frivolous thing uh, that you were uh, being late about so yeah that, that's certainly uh personal but at the same time i imagine there is some uh, cultural stuff at work there Uh, with the time, monochronic culture, <laughs> what a word. Uh, these are people focused on the clock, uh, planning their time, irritated when time is wasted. So I'd definitely put my uh, father-in-law into that category. <laughs> There's a picture of a clock in case you didn't know what a, a clock was. Uh, polychronic cultures, people focus on relationships instead of time. Um, so you might think that in some cultures it's kind of expected. And I, I noticed this to some extent here in the U.S. If somebody's really, really, quote unquote, important, uh, right? The idea is you, you're supposed to have to wait uh, a little bit, <laughs> you know, on them. Like they're worth wait, waiting for. Um, one of my, one of the things that I always, I always notice uh, with going to college and being a professor, uh, this idea of how long do you wait? as a student you know, if the professor hasn't shown up yet. You know, so if the class is supposed to start at one o'clock, and let's just say you, you go to class, you're sitting there, you know, five minutes rolls by, <laughs> there's still no sign of the professor. <laughs> uh, inevitably, somebody will say, well, you know, there's this rule. Uh, and, and the funny thing is the time it's changes, but they might say there's a 10 minute rule, there's a, a 15 minute rule. Um, and I've even heard people say, well, it depends on if it's a, is it a full professor? Is it a, a adjunct assistant professor? I mean, it gets kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, but part of that is, um, well, we're, we're part of this monochronic culture. If you're really obsessing about, uh, it's, it's 105, where's Martin? <laughs> uh, whereas the more polychronic uh, culture, they would probably think something like, uh, well, you know, we'll be here for an hour if that's what it takes, because we really, it's a very important uh, uh, professor or something. Um, or conversely, you might think uh, that if you're, if it's, if it's unimportant, right, that's when you would uh, be on time. Uh, but if it's really important, you should be a little late. And again, we, you do see some of this in America <clears throat> with the parties. And you say, well, you shouldn't show up. If the party starts at six o'clock, uh, you don't show up at uh, six o'clock and you, you certainly don't show up earlier than six o'clock. That's <laughs> considered rude. It's kind of more expected that you'll be uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes late uh, to be fashionably late. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, th I think this is a uh, really fascinating stuff. <laughs> yeah, don't plan. <laughs> uh, forget about the planners, I guess, in those uh, polychronic cultures. So if you are, I don't know if they give examples. I think they might have said Mexico is kind of this uh, polychronic, tends to be more polychronic. Uh, so if there, for example, you wouldn't say, well, be there, at, you know, the meeting's at 105. <laughs> the person, <laughs> and it's going to be just basically meaningless and you shouldn't get upset uh, if they do uh, show up late or a little early or whatever. All right, other nonverbal symbols. Uh, colors, um, you know, should you wear black? Should you wear white? What does that mean? You say, well, white means you're happy. Wearing all black, uh, it's kind of a sign of mourning. Right? Maybe you've lost a, a loved one, so you're in black. You don't really see that so much anymore, I guess. But it'd certainly be weird to uh, go to a wedding here in the U.S. and the, everybody's wearing black. Imagine the bride uh, showing up in a black dress. Uh, you think, well, that person's either being ironic or they're really trying to be different to kind of shake want to shake things up a little bit 
because really that should be a white dress is, you know, of course, the uh, norm. And by extension, the uh, rule is the other women there shouldn't wear white dresses. Uh, that's kind of I didn't I wasn't aware of that till recently. I went to uh, my brother's wedding and then uh, I don't remember some some that that happened or that was just a conversation topic. But <laughs> I was like, well, what's the big deal? And they said, well, they don't want to compete with the uh, the bride by uh, dressing in white. Kind of a strange concept, but it's just something just kind of a cultural thing I wasn't aware of. Um, but they say with the I think it's Japan. Yeah, here it is. Uh, in Japan, this is actually the uh, flipped again, right? So somebody wearing a, a all white, let's say, uh, that's the color of death. Uh, clothing. I don't know why that. I went backwards there. Uh, different cultures value age uh, differently. You know, some places. Uh, you really don't start getting any respect until you're in your, you know, at least in your 50s or your 60s. Uh, in other places, though, it's you try to hide your age. Right? You dye in your hair. You're worried about uh, getting uh, wrinkled or, or whatever, because um, we see that as you're kind of getting, uh, you're headed headed towards obsolescence. It's just kind of a real negative thing sometimes here. I feel like. Uh, whereas in other cultures, you would, I don't know if they'd go so far as to dye their hair gray. <laughs> Or you know, intentionally try to look older, uh, but it's it's certainly more emphasis on respect, uh, respecting the uh, older folks, and certainly not uh, disrespecting them. Uh, height, <laughs> they say people that are taller tend to make more money. <laughs> it's uh, certainly not fair. All right, so now we're moving into uh, oral uh, communications. And they start by saying you have to have, a, again, a cultural understanding. You can't assume it's one size fits all uh, when it comes to uh, people in other countries. Uh, so here's some things to be aware of. <clears throat> Understatements and exaggerations. <laughs> uh, so they gave the example there, I think, of, uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, in the, in the UK, uh, if you're just maybe you do something really incredible and you pull off this huge feed and it's uh, everybody just thinks you're amazing uh, when you're asked about it uh, you're supposed to say something like oh it was nothing you know <laughs> or if, <laughs> if you're uh, basically just really being humble and, and, and modest I guess you know maybe you've got millions of dollars and somebody asks you or you, you wall off and you might say well I got you know I'm, I'm comfortable <laughs> I've got a little a little put away uh, and so that's considered the proper way to be there. Um, they look, they would, I guess, if you were going around bragging or saying, uh, "Yeah, look, I'm just such an awesome guy." <laughs> I don't know anybody that would really say that here either, but um, I guess the idea is uh, not tooting your own horn. Is I think the phrase uh, we would use. Uh, whereas I have heard that is a problem here, uh, especially with job interviews and, and so on. That uh, somebody might be really good at a job and be really skilled, but if they're being too humble about it, and you know, if you, you know, if you're asked in an interview, oh, how well do you know C++? And you say, well, you know, I know a little bit about it. <laughs> uh, that, they might interpret that as, uh, well, that take it, he means he doesn't know it very well. Uh, maybe we shouldn't hire this person. Uh, maybe the person should have said, oh, I'm very fluent in C++. I'm, I'm really I'm really good at it. So that would be something there uh, you need to be aware of. So I guess uh, by extension uh, if you were applying for that programming job in Britain uh, you'd be you should uh, understate it uh, whereas if you're in America maybe you should exaggerate it. Uh, let's see the next one here. Compliments. Yeah they, they say these can be <laughs> problematic. Oh no kidding. Uh, I guess what they're, I assume they're not talking about just compliments like good job. Or you did a good, you did a good job on that assignment. Uh, maybe that could, I guess that could be considered condescending in, in some places. It might be a little strange to, uh, to be complimented on <clears throat> things that just, you're just doing your job, right? It's not, uh, some people say, well, you shouldn't say thank you. They're just doing their, their job. You know, I've heard people say things like that. 
Uh, I'm not really sure <laughs> uh, what all the range of... I tend to just jump into the idea of complimenting somebody on their appearance. Uh, if you say, if you compliment their clothes or, or how they look, uh, that's where I think you really get into kind of dangerous uh, territory uh, as far as being offen offensive to somebody. And they, you probably are better off, <clears throat> um, depending on the culture again. Is that completely taboo? Um, I would just say don't do it. Maybe if, if somebody compliments you, uh, you could take that as a sign that it's it's probably okay. But I would definitely err on the side of caution. Uh, let's see, approaches to negatives. You know, so should you tell somebody they failed? <laughs> or should you tell, just some, tell somebody ask you, should you just tell them no? Uh, a lot of people will try to get around this by posing it in the form of a question instead. You might, or say something like, well, you know, let me get back to you on that. Or, uh, <laughs> You know, let me let me think let me think about it. You, you try to get out of it instead of just telling them no. Uh, and apparently, this is something else that varies tremendously uh, between the Hmong cultures. All right, and here's some stuff about uh, international writing uh, to international audiences. So, if you're thinking about maybe you're emailing someone, uh, let's say you're emailing a branch of your company that's located in China uh, or Singapore. Uh, what are some things you might want to be thinking about? Uh, well, they start off saying by that uh, they start off saying most cultures are more formal uh, than the U.S. And I've definitely noticed this. I have some. Uh, I've written for a, a website several times, and the guy, I think they're based. I'm pretty sure they are based in Singapore. And, and I noticed this that they will uh, always refer to me as Doctor Barton. <laughs> and I've said, you know, just Matt is fine. I don't. Uh, it's, it's a little strange, this Dr. Barton uh, stuff. And uh, you can tell they're being very, it, it, to me, it just comes across like they're being over overly polite, uh, too formal. Uh, but again, that's just my cultural lens uh, coming through there. Uh, I should respect that. I shouldn't, maybe they would just make them real uncomfortable calling me Matt. You know, and, and what difference does it make really to me? Uh, I just want them to be comfortable. That should be my uh, my goal as a communicator. Uh, so let's see, avoid uh, first names. <laughs> I just, just talked about that. Uh, use their titles. Uh, so if it is you know, Dr. Barton, and I always say if that's, however somebody introduces him or herself, that's what I try to stick with. Um, <laughs> man, I remember <laughs> uh, one time uh, somebody, I was thinking of uh, like a dentist, right? And I, it's like, well, does it, should you call the, your dentist a doctor, so and so? Uh, I don't know what kind of degree they have. <laughs> and then I started thinking, you know, this person is going to have a drill in my mouth here pretty quick. Uh, maybe I should err on the side of uh, being <laughs> formal. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, use the titles. Uh, contractions, you know, can't, won't, etc. They say don't use them. They, they are considered informal. Um, uh, slang, well, that just seems like common sense. <laughs> you wouldn't uh, talk about somebody being, um, uh, what's some I'm kind of outmoded myself these days. I'm not even sure what the, the kids are using for slang. <laughs> uh, I remember one that even got me as a kid, though. Um, Michael Jackson had released an, a song called uh, Bad. And the song had just come out, and I hadn't even heard it yet. Uh, but <clears throat> I got a paperback from my English teacher, and she, uh, across the top, uh, had bad, an ex exclamation point. <laughs> and I was like, just a little kid, you know, I was really upset about this. And I thought, wow, I've done really horrible. Uh, and then she saw my reaction, and she's like, well, what... You know, I didn't mean that in the, I mean, it's bad that way. I mean, it's bad, you know, <laughs> like what? She's like, haven't you heard the song, uh, Michael Jackson? Uh, it's bad is good. I was like, what? <laughs> anyway, that's kind of a strange example, I guess. But uh, that's the idea of you might think, well, everybody knows the, the song and uh, everybody knows what, what this means. But uh, again, you don't know. Maybe the person hasn't heard the song or is completely unaware of 
of that whole genre of, of music. Uh, same thing with idioms. Uh, so we use these all the time. Uh, somebody was telling me about, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but they, they something about duck, duck, and goose, <laughs> or duck, duck, gray duck, or something. And I just, I, don't, I still have no clue what, what the heck that, that's all about. Uh, so somebody was using that to try to communicate something to me. I would just be puzzled by it. I, I wouldn't know. And same is true. Uh, if, I always think about the uh, uh, this next one here, the sports metaphors. So it, it really strikes me how uh, in America, football means the NFL and we know all the names for things like touchdowns and, and yards and uh, quarterbacks and all that. <laughs> uh, but the Super Bowl and, and all this stuff. We all know these metaphors and use them uh, all the time. Or baseball is another one. You say somebody is going to strike out or three strikes, you're out. Uh, something like that. Uh, so we, we're using these all the time, not even aware uh, or caring maybe that Really, nobody else uh, plays uh, football. You go to any other country and start talking about football, and of course they're they'll think you're talking about soccer. You know that's uh, <laughs> they couldn't really care less about the Super Bowl. You know they want they're they're <clears throat> concerned about the World Cup. Uh, let's say. So again, just something to be aware of. Uh, really, what this is all about is just not assuming everybody's cut from the same cloth. Uh, not everybody's like you. Uh, a lot of stuff like interest in football is unique uh, to the U.S. and it's not shared uh, across cultures. And if you're aware of that, you can just easily avoid it and avoid the confusion. Now, if you're not aware of it, though, then you'll be just endlessly confusing. You won't be an effective communicator. All right, so here's just some more tips about this. Uh, write in English and less fluent in audience's language. I mean, that'll just be common sense. I have a notice, though, uh, the idea that Google was a Google Translate. And so somebody gets the bright idea that, oh, well, I just copy and paste my email in Google Translate. And, you know, bada boom, bada bing. Now, now it's in uh, German. <laughs> and they send that off. And, oh, my God, you know, who knows how accurate that is? Who even knows what you're saying? Uh, that, that's a terrible idea. Uh, so unless you are fluent in that language, or at least know enough to be able to read it and make sense of it, uh, just leave it to them. Uh, just write it in English. Uh, reconsider the patterns of organization. Uh, so they talked again about how the uh, in the U.S., if you think about writing a, a business letter, you know you start with the purpose for writing, and then as you go along the letter, you get into the details, right? Uh, in other countries, though, that would be considered rude or uncouth, uh, barbaric, <laughs> even. Like, you should never just start uh, with the business right away. You got to uh, kind of go on about uh, maybe you need to flatter the person a little bit first to talk about their family a little bit, kind of beat around the bushes, uh, the, what, what I would call it. Uh, buffering negative messages make uh, requests indirect. And so you could imagine if uh, you, somebody's giving you a problem, uh, you wouldn't just tell them to <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> you might say, hey, can you, uh, would you mind uh, lowering the volume or something like that? Rethinking the audience benefits, ones that motivate U.S. audience uh, may not work. Now, so we have talked a little bit uh, already about like in the, in China and some of these other countries where they're more group oriented you know they might not care about so much about if there's a benefit that's only going to make uh, them stand out or make them uh, s signal their <laughs> uh, let me think of a different way to put this so you know imagine you're a student sitting in a classroom and the professor says uh, you know you did a great job on your e on your letter let's say your uh, essay i'm going to uh read this <laughs> essay out loud <laughs> uh and the you know, professor might be thinking, "This is I'm really honoring you. I'm really motivating uh, you by doing this." But you know, maybe you're like, "Oh God, I'm so embarrassed." You know what? Next time, I'm deliberately going to write a worse essay just so I don't have to risk uh, being called out like this. And so, you know, take that kind of concept, but, but apply it uh, to a, 
through a whole cultural lens and you can start to see how uh, you might really think this is going to go over well it's really going to motivate them but it might actually have the opposite effect uh, allowing extra response time and again this is just common sense um, you know the person's going to have might, might have to translate it go somewhere have it translated uh, they might if they want to write back to you in english they might have that that whole process might uh, take some time uh, so you can't expect just that rapid turnaround that you would get all right learning about international business communication and this is the, the final thoughts here <laughs> Uh, so first thing is uh, it's beyond a set of rules so we always think uh, oh well let's see I'm, I'm going to go give this presentation in China uh, next month uh, where's the rules <laughs> uh, where's the book about how to do this and all the uh, do's and don'ts you know there's really no there's maybe some basic stuff like that but it's, it's really going to be much more beyond just some kind of simplistic do's and don'ts list right it's just really deeper stuff and you probably wouldn't you probably just i don't know if there's any way you really uh you could just be prepared to do that and be totally uh knowledgeable uh, that's why and in college we stress here at st cloud state too uh, very really try to emphasize how important it is as, as a student uh, we got all these international programs you can go take classes in other countries you know you could you can volunteer for things and, and go to uh, just pretty much any other, even just going to Canada. You know, it's just right, <laughs> right up the road, literally. Um, anything like that will help you immensely. Uh, and you'll, get, you'll learn a lot more that way, even just traveling and tourism, uh, than you will by just trying to sit down on, and look at the, uh, you know, a website, some kind of list of uh, rules about <laughs> communicating in China. <laughs> Uh, you won't really you'll never get a good sense of it unless you're there and you have some uh, international experience well as the international business practices are constantly evolving and changing and so one of the things i have a lot of uh, uh chinese colleagues over the years here uh, we're trying to build a better relationship or stronger connections between uh, the china uh, china has there's some universities there that kind of want to partner up with us and uh, send students back and forth and uh, one of the things I noticed in some of these books I've read about Chinese uh, cultural practices, it's just not, I don't notice that they, they, these colleagues I'm talking about, they don't do this stuff like the, the bowing. You know, I've never seen them uh, bow uh, to, to me. <laughs> they just shake hands. And so that's just something I'm sure that uh, over there, whatever class is like this uh, for them, uh, probably said, this, told them, look, you go to America, uh, they're not bowing to each other. They'll, they won't they will know what to make of that. Just shake their hands uh, instead. And you know, that's something that's probably evolved and, and changed fairly recently. Uh, so it, basically what this point is, you can't just assume. You know, imagine you had this book from like a, the 1950s about uh, doing business in Mexico, let's say. And you could, would really any of that information be uh, trustworthy? I mean, it's, it's probably changed so much that I would even, I probably wouldn't even advise reading it. You'd probably get more misinformation than, than accurate information. Uh, yeah, seeking and talking to people from other backgrounds. Oh, yeah, I just cannot stress this enough. And, and if, you're, if you're one of those types, I don't know a lot of uh, uh, folks here at St. Cloud, Oh, they, they don't tend to be real uh, gregarious. <laughs> uh, they don't want to just meet people all the time, and, and they're kind of nervous. They're shy, basically. Uh, I know people that I've had students that I mean, they don't talk to anybody in the class, and as soon as it, uh, they can go, they go straight home, and <laughs> uh, they talk to their friends they've had from high school, I guess, or forever, and their family, of course. But uh, they really don't want to just—they're not real comfortable chatting with people that they don't know. And I say that's just something you have to break out of. Even if it's really uncomfortable for you, uh, try to just sort of force yourself to say, uh, hi, <laughs> hi, person in the class, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's get, let's be friends. Um, especially if it's somebody from another uh, country, uh, because you can learn so much uh, from that person. And, and I think back on my own uh, friends I've had from, I've had friends from Russia, of course, uh, China. I've had lots of India, uh, Indian friends. 
you know, all these people that I know, and I've learned all, oh, so much more from them, uh, just getting to know them and, uh, you know, having conversations, basically, uh, than I would ever get from some kind of uh, just a bunch of generalizations and stereotypes. Uh, usually those stereotypes turn out to be completely wrong. All right, I think that will, uh, oh, well, they had one more point. Enhance understanding of multiple uh, perspectives, yeah. All right, so I think we're done here. Uh, if you do have anything you'd like to add, any comments, questions, uh, whatever it is, uh, I would like to hear that. Uh, but in any case, I hope you enjoyed this and see you next time.